Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Palmer. I'm the IT director for ForbiddenPlanet.com and Titan Entertainment Group. Uh, ForbiddenPlanet.com is the UK's and Europe's leading science fiction retailer. And Titan Publishing Group is the UK's leading publisher of film and TV time materials. I've currently been an IT director for 23 years in the IT industry for that long. And uh, 22 of those, I've been developing FileMaker solutions. I started out uh, developing on a Mac Plus. So developing FileMaker solutions on a nine inch screen was a bit of a challenge. Um, I don't know how many of you went to Vegas two years ago, but um, I was dragged out at the keynote for five minutes to give an introduction of what we've built for our warehouse system. So I don't know if any of you remember that. So if you do, you will probably recognize this slide. Um, it's been updated a little bit, but these are some of the licenses we work with. It's only the tip of the iceberg of the portfolio of the range that we have. This is our world. Our world uh, consists of, we have five servers running in VMware in our data center. And we have 10 locations across the UK. Uh, we have 250 users, of which we have worldwide users. We have people in the US, Australia using our systems. Uh, predominantly, most of those are in the UK, though, and a few in, U in Europe as well. We have 45 solutions uh, using 132 files, and we have over 125 million records in those FileMaker solutions. I think we use every facet of FileMaker. Uh, we use pretty much whatever they give us. So if, we, if FileMaker gives us it, we'll, we'll try and implement that within our solutions. And we have 55 iPads deployed out in the field across our warehouse and what we use for stock takes, et cetera. Uh, before we came out here, we, we had a look at where our FileMaker systems were being used within our, our basic portfolio of our, our office. And we're proud to say that we've got a FileMaker solution being used by every single department. So our, our business purely runs on FileMaker, it would seem. Um, the team. Uh, I'm the lead developer. As I say, I've been using FileMaker for a long time. I started in version 2. Um, Penny Ruddles, my senior FileMaker developer, who is here somewhere. I don't know where she is. I don't think she's in this room. She's looking at something else. I told her to not be in here. I didn't want her in here. Um, she's been using FileMaker from ver version 7, and I have two other developers, Rossman and Daniel, who started at version 11. Um, the department is certified from versions 10 to 15, so we have certifications across the employment of the FileMaker developers. We have some great products that we have within our organization, so from TARDISes that time travel to lightsabers. So, and we get to work with some of this material all the time. It's a bit... It's a bit daunting at times when you're trying to develop and you've got really cool stuff coming through the door. It kind of distracts you a little bit, but um, we still get the job done. What I hope you get from this session is just a, a brief overview about how we plan, how we develop, and what we do. So um, I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So back to why you're here. Um, just out of interest, how many of you are here because you're Star Wars fans and you don't care about what I'm talking about? Fine, good, fine. <laughs> Brilliant, I'll leave now then. Fine, okay, cool. Um, uh, well, I, uh, hopefully there's a bit of fun in this that you'll appreciate. So, um, But there is some FileMaker stuff in here as well. Um, I paint the scene. What happened last year is in just before DevCon uh, last year, uh, hence the reason why I didn't attend DevCon last year, because I was too busy doing this. So. Um, our operations director got in touch with us and said, we've done a deal with Sony and Disney to host an event. And Sony's was, we were running, um, they were running the European exhibition, so in London and London Excel, and we had negotiated to have the biggest stand at that exhibition. Now, my operations director said, well, we want a till system to run this. Now, we, didn't, we, we have till systems, we've got retail outlets, but we didn't have a till system that we could just pick up and go. It was with another vendor, and so we couldn't use it. So we decided to look at whether we could build one. So in the same breath, he then said, oh, also, we're doing a pop-up shop for the launch of the Ghostbusters film. So we partnered up with Sony Entertainment, and said, they said to us, well, what you want to do is have a shop in the busiest in Europe's busiest mainline station, and we had to house that shop. So that was our brief. Um, so we were going to run the, the Star Wars exhibition for three days, 
and the Ghostbusters store was running for a four-week promotion. All we had at the time were little nine-inch laptops that could scan barcodes for, just basically ca capture the barcodes, but we had no way of grabbing that information uh, live. We had to wait for the kit to come back, download the kit, and then we could analyze the data. So we didn't have anything for, fit for purpose. So this was the spec. We went through it. Um, obviously, it had to be a till, it had to function. Um, we were required to have multiple payment methods. So we realized at conventions when we had them before that there were certain instances where someone comes up with, I use dollars because in, Amer in America, not pounds. Um, they come up with $20 to buy this thing. Um, and then they see all this other stuff at the till and they want to buy all of it. So they say, oh, can you take the $20 on that and we'll have the rest on the card. So we had to have multiple payment methods within our till system. Um, till consolidation came up because of Star Wars. We had 12 tills that we were deploying, so that was something else we had to deal with. We decided not to do any receipt, physical paper receipt. We were just going to do an email receipt. So we had to build an email system so the customer could then type their email address in and send that off. So local restocks was something that we had to do. At the Star Wars exhibition, we had a section like this behind a curtain. It was all stock behind it. So we had to tell people what was selling on the stand so we could then replenish the actual stand. So we had to work out how to report that as well. Um, and that gave us the, also the request for the buyers that were working at head office to know what was selling so they knew what to replen from the warehouse for various days as well. Um, because we were working with Disney and we were working with um, Sony, we had done a, a deal with them. For Sony, we decided to sell their cinema tickets actually in the station. What they were doing is they were promoting the film and we had to keep track of what was being sold. So, so we had special requests that we had to match product. With Star Wars, Hasbro gave us an exclusive figure that you couldn't get anywhere else in the world, and we were the only stand that could sell it. So we had to track the sales of that action figure as well. Um, with Hasbro, they wanted hourly reporting back of how it was selling. So, um, and we also then had to build, to get the buyers to do the ordering, we had to build a central restock module. And with my talk two years ago, with the warehouse system that we built, we had to integrate it with that. So we basically spoke to the operations director and said, yep, yeah, fine. Went and had a look at this list. I went away with Penny. We sat down for a half, half an hour. Well, yeah, we can do all this. It's not a problem. And so we thought, right, we'll go back. And we, we asked the main question you always ask that you don't really want to know what the answer is. We said, well, when do you need it by? And he came up with three weeks. So, so we had literally three weeks to build that. And so with that, we ran out the room and decided to sit down and think about how we would go and approach this. So this is how we plan. On every project that we do, this is the planning process that we go through. Now, I hope you all do this, because you should do. Um, we work out what spec can be achieved. It's a, if it's a big spec, can it be achieved within the time frame as well? And I'm pleased to say, so far, in 20 odd years of developing FileMaker solutions, I've yet to have a system that we can't deliver in FileMaker. Yes, sometimes we plug it into other things, but pretty much we can always deliver it. Um, we always identify a stakeholder as well, so these are key things. But I'm not going to go through all of these, because I'll go through them in more detail. But there's a particular reason why we plan to this level. Now, most of you, if you don't plan, you'll get frictions and disagreements within your build. Now, if you do, you resolve them. We're going in a room usually shouting at each other, and someone wins. For us, it's a bit different, because stuff like this happens. <laughs> so, and it's, uh, HR really don't like this, because staff turnover goes through the roof, so it's not very good. So, so as I say, coming back to the list, uh, can it be achieved? As I said, yes, with FileMaker. The stakeholders thing is a key thing, because certainly when you're working with short time frames and, and time scales, you need to get an answer to a decision quickly, otherwise the development slows down. So for us, it was, it, it was key. We're in-house developers. So we've got, I've got four developers, and we're all in-house. We can have the discussions quickly of how we move the build forward, and usually it's a department manager that we have to go and approach. That's easy, I can just go upstairs and talk to them. Some of you guys will be working with external clients, and in this instance, we did. We had to deal with Sony and Disney. So, it, it's not alien to us, but it was an added complication to the build. 
infrastructure is a big thing. Obviously, with FileMaker, you've got all the different technologies you can use. So we have to find out which one fits the purpose best. So it's usually going to be, is it going to run in Pro? Is it going to run in Go, WebDirect? And, or is it a custom web function? So it, it's something you have to decide. With this project, we decided to go with Go and to use iPads. We knew we wanted small form factor on the till. We didn't want a big, bulky till of any, any kind. We didn't have enough space on the stand design that we found out that to put pretty much a Mac Mini in a screen, it wouldn't work. So iPad was the best choice. Connectivity was a big issue for us because I, I knew with Waterloo Station where it was being held for the Ghostbusters event, I go through it every morning. So I know I can get 4G signal in there, no problems at all. So I have internet connection. There was no way we were going to get structured cable in the station. They won't allow it. So that wasn't going to happen. But with Star Wars, as something like this, I have to say the Wi-Fi in here is brilliant. So, um, but when we've done exhibitions and shows before, you don't always know what signal strength you're going to have. Now, when you go and test these things, you go in there, the show's empty, you've just got the stands, it's all fine. When 20,000 people come in, all with their iPhones on, they're all Snapchatting, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. So usually, signal strength goes down. So we just didn't know how we were going to do with this. But the, the main thing with the till is it had to be redundant. We, we couldn't have a till foul, because if the till failed, we're not taking money. And no money, no revenue, no profit. So for us, it had to be reliable. So we've isolated the obstacles, which is time and connectivity, really. Um, and then the next process we always go through is how the end-to-end -end journey happens for the user. So they are scanning an item, taking the sale, what is the requirements? And we literally map out every process. Now, the purpose of doing this is so we can then go away and then we can build modules that relate to those. So once we've created that plan and that end-to-end -end stage, we can then we can put the plan around it of the work that's required for each module. We can then timeline that, allocate the resources to then achieve the build. Only when we get to that point can we ask the question whether or not we can deliver the build. So, and in this instance, we stupidly said yes. So, um, what we came up with was a very basic design, but we had three weeks, so please forgive us. Um, it was a simple design, but it had to work on an iPad, so we went for clear design, color target areas, and touch compliance so the user could use it. We just wanted it to be as simple to use. An additional thing we had to deal with was the guys looked at this and said, well, the products that are going in there, we need to load them up front. So they created a little product uh, management tool within the iPad that they could add and amend products. And the reason for this, this came up of a discussion the developers had in their own accord. I, think I wasn't even privy to this, but they went and built it. But um, is because suppliers, we knew there were some products that we hadn't even seen in our warehouse. And they were being delivered the day before the conventions. So we had no way to proof them, test them, make sure they scan all right, like we normally would do with our normal retail operations. So they designed this so they could then, if a product turned up, which it would do, because suppliers can't seem to understand what a barcode is when they supply the, the manifest, um, they could amend those on the tills and update, and then we can carry on trading. In addition, uh, the guys also went a bit mad, even though the time frame was so tight, and they built extra modules that wasn't even asked for. So. Um, we had a petty cash advanced system that they came up with that would be useful. We had like 27 or 28 people on the stand. They need to drink. They need to be able to do stuff so they can take money out from the till. We can log that. Finance loved us for it, and that was all good. One of the other ones I thought was really good is they came up with a way that if a buyer was on the stand and a supplier came up to them, they could just unhook the till, walk off, do an off-book sale so they can go and have a coffee with the actual uh, supplier, do the sale, log the sale, and then come back, and it's all recorded. So they can go away in private and do that. So that was one of the extra modules for the off-stand. So. Um, the restock module, its purpose had to be to consolidate the tills, do the sales analysis, calculate the restock quantities, and then send it to the warehouse. And I'll go over this in a little more detail now. So basically, how it worked was all the iPads basically there was a script that runs on those, and then we had to get that file off of the iPad over to the central solution. Now, we weren't sure about connectivity, how it's going to work, so it, we went for the easy option, which we know send an email with a file attachment usually works. So if we can get, a, we had to get connection some way. So we went with MiFi boxes. We had a MiFi box underneath the, the tills. A MiFi box, as you may know or not, only holds 10 users usually. 
So we had two of those, one on each till bank. So there's six tills on each side. And then if we had connection problems, as I said earlier, we would do, because we did, you could just take that MiFi box, pick it up, grab the iPad, walk out the convention center, sync the data, and bring it back. And in some instances, we had to do that. So it gave us that redundancy that we were looking for. There was a way of getting that data. So it sends an email. It then pushes it to our bot system, which is our own in-house bot system we've written in FileMaker. It processes about 200 jobs uh, from our day-to-day -day processes and does about 12,000 transactions a day. So that picks up the emails, processes the file, churns it through, and sends it over to the restocking module. Now at that point, I'll go back one. Ah, typical. At that point, the restocking module then, the buyers at head office can then see what's been sold. It told them when the last sync was for all the iPads. If an iPad didn't sync or was out, they got notified. So if they only synced 11 of the iPads and not the 12th one, that's no good, because that could be the one that's at the front of the desk that's doing the most sales. So it stopped them from doing the reorder until we got all the data. It calculated, it, with the calculation of the restock module was something that the guys spent quite a bit of time on, about three minutes, because that's all they had. Um, they, they, all it did is work out, we worked out when we were at the stand at Star Wars, we had two restocking modules from the warehouse, two restocking intervals that we could get. So there's just two days, we were only there for three days. So it worked out the rate of sale from the last restock module to the next restock module, if you get what I mean. And it did that per till, depending on when they downloaded the file. So it then calculated that module and then said, right, okay, here's the recommendation, what you need to restock. That should get you at current rate of sale to the next restock window. Obviously, the buyer can override that if they see fit. So it then calculated that process, put it into our warehouse system. The warehouse system then churned that through, created the pick list. The warehouse users then grabbed their iPads as they normally do, went and picked the items, and then it went on the van and off to the convention. So. Once we got to that point, we pretty much had the system ready. So, um, but we didn't know whether, coming back to the redundancy, whether or not it would work. So we needed to test it. Now, this, this is the key testing that we do on most of our products. Um, obviously, the external testing is not always done. It depends how big the project is. But if you want total redundancy, I'd urge you to do the bottom one as well. But the key ones, we, we test as we build, as I'm sure you will do. We test with other developers because we've got four in the team. So we can just pass code over to someone else and say, can you cast your eye over that? Um, we even test with staff that have nothing to do with the project. So we'll just call someone down from another department and say, right, have a look at this. Does it work? And if they say, yep, fine, that seems okay, they don't even know what they're doing. But they usually invariably will click on a button stupidly, and you'll find out it's, it, it either works or doesn't. I was in John Sindler's um, session earlier, and he was saying about videoing the content as you build. And I think that was quite a clever idea, and I think we'll start implementing that. So if we video it and play it for ourselves, you'll, you'll find the errors yourself as well. But the external test was so important for us because we had to make sure it was going to work. So I gave it to my friends, grabbed an iPad, gave it to my friends. I even hired my son. So he was very happy, he got paid. So he came in, I gave him an iPad with the system on it and a notepad and a pen and said, where you go? And he's like, what do I do? I said, whatever you want. Just don't come out the system and if anything looks like it goes wrong, write it down. And he came back with about three sheets of A4 paper back into us and when we had to go fix all the buttons. Um, but we wanted it bulletproof. So there was only one thing to do and that was give it to my mum. Because if she can use it, anyone can use it. And it, it passed the test, absolutely passed the test. So. The other thing we do is analysis. We, we've got our own analysis tools we use. Um, we look at the data that's going in the systems, and then we look at what comes out of that to see whether or not it works. So I'm not going to go into this too much detail, but the, the key thing is, is look at what the data journey is for your system. It will give you an insight to whether or not it works. And in that way, you can learn, you can adapt, and improve your system based on the results that you see. In this instance, Star Wars was one area where we looked at the data. So these are the tracking the sales as they were going through the tills. Um, we highlighted one area that was, that black line is the average line for the rate of sale. And you can see that was heavily loaded earlier in the day. That, that graph is basically from, uh, I think it's 9 a.m. across. So we realized before 2 p.m. was our, our peak time. So 
Staff didn't like this request, but they weren't allowed to take a break, weren't allowed to take lunch, weren't allowed to do anything. They had to be on the stand, so we fully staffed the stand early in the morning. With Ghostbusters, it was the other way around. You can see that there was hardly any sales at the early part of the day. Now, what Sony had done is they put representatives in the station to promote the film and sell the tickets. So we went back with this data to them and said, look, you really don't need to be here that early. And it, I suppose it was an obvious thing, but they stipulated to us. It was their deal, their, their idea. They said we had to be there from 7 in the morning. So I go through that station, and if I'm going to work and I come through and I'm running late, I'm not going to stop off and buy a T-shirt. So, but when I'm going home, if I miss the train, I've got 15, 20 minutes in the station. So it made sense to do it the other way around. But the data shows that, that story. This is a rough idea of the slices of what we do, uh, of what I've just discussed, and the time frames based on the project. Now, this isn't in order, it's in order of time frame. So we spent the most of the time on this product planning it. And less than a quarter of the time is actually building it. And I think that's, that's the benefit of what FileMaker gives us, is the fact that we can rapidly build these things. They work. We spent a lot of time testing, um, and then the rest is just extra stuff on the project. So. That was a stand. Our stand was 30 meters wide by 15 meters deep, and it had a lot of Star Wars product on it. <laughs> Hell of a lot of Star Wars product. And I have just got a very short film of what it was like when it opened. got so congested it was like herding cattle through a farmer's market. So, um, On Ghostbusters, it was very, very different. So, um, as I said, Waterloo Station is Europe's busiest transport hub. You know, there's a million people going through it every day. So, what we get from that, the station organizers, is the fact that we wanted to, well, it wasn't us, Sony and their representatives wanted to kit the entire station out. That was 19 platforms to have marketing on it. The whole concourse, everything. And because the station runs for such long periods of time, we were given a window of from 1 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. to kit the whole station out. So I'd have to say, I'd like to take the praise on that. It wasn't us. Sony did all that. But we had to go in and set the, the store up that they built for us in that time window. We had to get stock into that store. It was only a tiny store, which you'll see in a minute. But the organizational skills of that was amazing. And we put together with Sony a film of how they kitted out the station. So. It's a phenomenal amount of work in a really short period of time. So. That was the store. It's quite small. It's not every day you see a New York sub station, subway station in a central London station. But, um, and it did pull a crowd because everyone wondered what, what, how a New York substation was sitting there. So. How did we do? Uh, we had a total of 14 tills across two events. Uh, 16 staff used the till with no training at all. They literally came in and used it. We didn't have to train. We wanted it to be that simple to use. We did have a test button on the till so they could throw it in test mode and just try it. So no, there was no worry. Uh, we sold just under 16,000 units across the both events. And looking at the data, the peak transaction time, we were selling a product every four seconds. And four developers, actually the build time for the four developers to do that was just three days. So, so that, that's all it took. So four of us were working on that for three days concurrently. So it was a 12 day build time if you took that as a single developer. Um, and I think you can agree that FileMaker Forbidden Planet is a pretty good partnership. So. Um, there won't be updates for this, and I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Please fill out the uh, evaluations, and if you've got any questions, or is it time for drinks? I don't know which one it is. So. Thank you very much.
No questions? Drinks it is then. So, <laughs> Brilliant. Superb. Thank you. Thank you for your time.